Okay, my clock shows uh, 10 uh, a.m. Pacific time, also known as SL time. So uh, let me uh, call our session to order today. Um, welcome to the uh, Science Circle series of panel discussions. I'm glad you all could make time to join us today. Uh, I think we have a fun topic. Um, it's going to be a little bit casual, uh, but I thought it would be uh, worthwhile to um, have an opportunity to uh, talk about science books that, uh, you know, that are written for a popular audience. Um, I think uh, it, uh, people might be curious to know what, um, what kind of resources are out there. If they, you know, if you're interested in a topic, um, and, uh, you know, want to delve into it deeper. Um, lots of uh, prominent scientists have written books for a popular audience and um, sometimes sort of describing their career or their own work or to survey a topic or something like that. And um, I think it's worthwhile to take a little time. You know, in past panels, we've talked about science fiction a lot. Um, and I thought we'd give it a little twist this time and talk about actual science rather than science fiction. Um, so that's kind of my um, thinking about this topic. And with that, I will introduce our panel members. Uh, we have a distinguished panel here to share the books that they like. Uh, we have a Wordsmith uh, Jarvanen here on my left, moving down in that order. Uh, also, have um, uh, Stephen Zudify, and next to him is Vic uh, Machalak, and finally we have Mike Shaw. I think uh, our students here are familiar with all our panelists, uh, and I think uh, you know they're uh, very enjoyable to uh, uh, to listen to. Um, so um, and so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over. We're gonna I'm going to start with. Uh, wordsmith and ask him to maybe say a few words and then just get right into whatever books he want he wants to talk about and we'll move down the panel in that way and hopefully uh, we'll have enough time at the end to have more of a, um, a kind of a roundtable conversation perhaps uh, so wordsmith uh, why don't you uh, uh, why don't you start us off thanks um, my own background is as a computational physicist. Um, I've also taught massage courses and mostly anatomy and kinesiology. So um, theory into practice. Um, in world um, right now, I'm uh, chancellor of Oxbridge, which is a uh, new resident uh, training area uh, with some socialization and uh, opportunities for further socialization. Um, Off-world, I'm more um, doing things like uh, word analysis of tweets at conferences and uh, science writing. So. Um, the books I chose um, well, actually, I should say I, I sort of chose because there's there's a lot of um, good resources out there. I wanted to mention that uh, um, for publications, um, New Scientist and um, Science News are both aimed at the layperson um, with good articles. There's a online site Science Daily that summarizes a night um, a lot of uh, science articles on a more readable basis. Um, a couple books that had interested me along the way are first the book Linked by uh, Albert Laszlo Barabasi which is on networks and how networks form um, he goes way back to 150 years to Euler and solving the Königsberg bridge problem, a, a um, 
island and a river um, with seven bridges. And it was, uh, people were asking back then, uh, can you find a path that crosses each bridge only once? And the answer Euler was able to show was no. But what was unique about what Euler did is he took the bridge problem and made it a graph problem with nodes and links between the nodes. And in that form, it was much easier uh, to solve. Uh, Barabasi also talks about if you start with a um, cocktail party with a hundred people who don't know each other and let them mingle for a while, they'll just start discussing in twos and threes. And then you tell some of them that the wine with one label is much better than the other, um, but only tell the the people you've met and talked with, then um, that information starts spreading and then people move on and form new groups and you can follow the spreading of a piece of information as the, as the uh, uh, different people in the room create links, social network links, and then the information propagates with the, the linking. So it's some fascinating science uh, of that ties in with things like um, cellular communication links, um, because generally you have um, enzymes that um, promote some effect and enzymes that retard some effect. And there's this whole communication network, um, including in um, um, work on cancer and uh, working to ameliorate or slow down or control cancer. The uh, author is Albert Laszlo Barabasi, and the book is linked. Another book, and maybe it's the similarity um, maybe it's the similarity in names um, is a book by the mathematician Stephen Strogatz, uh, and the name is Sync. So we've gone from linked to sync. Um, some years back. Uh, Strogatz wrote an article in Scientific American, another source often of um, lay-directed um, articles. And that article was about fireflies in Thailand. And, okay, fireflies, you know, they it's night, they light up. But these fireflies have a special property. They not only light up, they fall into sync or synchronization. And so the whole riverbanks will flash on and off at once um, rather than the um, fireflies flashing independently. Uh, other examples of this effect um, of synchronization without a conductor. No, nobody is, you know, pointing at each firefly and saying, you, you were late, speed it up a little. Um, audiences at the end of a performance clapping. And within seconds, everyone's clapping together. Um, nobody directed that. It just happened. Um, if... So do American ones um, very often um, clap together. Very interesting. Um, I, yeah, I sort of consider it a hallmark of Russian audiences in particular that they sort of clap, you know, in rhythm. 
But I think that's true that in, if you have a large enough audience, uh, it does, I think it frequently tends to just uh, gravitate that way. It's interesting. Yeah, go into synchronization. And, and the amazing thing is it happens without anybody directing that. You know, it's just every, every person who you might think of as a cell in other contexts um, getting some input from others and very quickly drop into synchronization. We have 10,000 cells in our heart that are um, pulse makers and they synchronize even though the individual cells might have slightly different rhythms, natural rhythms, they basically listen or sense when each other are firing and synchronize and that sets up our heartbeat. Uh, when that fails we have fib fibrillation of the heart. But um, So in another example of what might be called oscillators dropping the natural synchro uh, synchronization. Yeah, it really seems like a powerful mechanism um, and really uh, sort of an, it's not so much an explanation, but it sort of provides a context for the way the way lots of things in nature uh, become naturally self-organized. Yeah, um, it was noticed that um, two um, pendulum clocks on the same wall would drop into synchronization. So they're communicating along the wall. Um, that is slightly, and it's enough that over time they, they synchronize. So, um, that's, yeah, that, that's, that's just so, such an interesting topic. Well, since we do have a large panel, if you don't mind, Wordsmith, let, let me move along and, and uh, let's uh, have a seat by um, take it up. Sounds good. And um, uh, Stephen, why don't you say a few words and tell us what books you want to talk about? All right. Thanks, Baragon. I, uh, you know, the history of always being a bench and experimental scientist. That's where I did my graduate and postdoc work. And then I did a detour to teaching for a while. And this was in late, you know, starting about 2007 through 2016. And this was an amazing time. I think in the popularization of science for biology, because if you think back, many of you are probably old enough to remember the name Stephen Jay Gould, and I'll start off with him in just a second. But for some reason, in that period of time, there was an amazing flowering of both interesting evolutionary biology, and then scientists, again, hardcore scientists, who I think in some ways got recruited to popularize and talk about their science in, in different media. And so it was a great time both to take those books and that those media to actually use them for teaching and developing courses. So that was something I got heavily involved with and did end up teaching a history and philosophy of science class that I developed at Ball State University. So the books I've chosen are ones that are uh, two essay related books, because again, you don't want to give students books that are too long to read in any given semester. And then the middle book is one I didn't teach from, but I think is actually just a great example of something for people to, to read in a popular audience. So let me start with Stephen Jay Gould, and he was a paleontologist, uh, evolutionary biologist, and again, an amazing and very prolific writer. Uh, someone who, you know, there are like, I think 10 or 12 collections of his essays that you can now buy as, uh, as books. And one of his, uh, large themes was trying to make the case for evolutionary biology. Remember, this is, again, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, uh, a little bit more of a conservative uh, bent to America at the time. And he was always trying to make the logical rhetorical case for why evolution is a very believable science and to take examples from it. So one of his, again, most famous works is an essay called The Panda's Thumb. And what I have up here is, again, the book cover for the collection of essays. And I'm actually going to pop into local chat real quick. You can actually get the entire book as a PDF at this website. So if you ever wanna read through his essays yourself, they're great 
and they're available there. And Scissor G Menson mentions Bully for Brontosaurus, and that is that is just one of his excellent ones. He one thing that he did do. Let me just back up for a second. Is he focused a lot on things that people would relate to? So he did a lot of essays on dinosaurs at the time. So that was a great part of what he, he understood in terms of reaching out to a non-science audience. So what I have up here is just an example of the anatomy of the panda, which as you know, is a bear. It technically is in the family carnivora, but in fact, it only eats bamboo. And so this is one, at face value, very bizarre looking, and two, means that a lot of things had to have happened for the animal to be able to eat uh, become a vegetarian from being a meat eater. Well, actually bar bears were technically always omnivores. So this picture shows the comparative anatomy of a human thumb, which is in green, and then also this modification of the radial sesamoid bone that allows pandas to help strip bamboo shoots and leaves from the stick so they can eat them more easily. And so again, if you look at the panda hand, it looks like it has maybe six fingers, and what's important to recognize here is that this is a small modification of one bone for an important evolutionary adaptation. And so this type of comparative anatomy and talking to it to an audience was something he really did excel at. And what I'm gonna pop up here next is just random cute picture of said panda because it's cute and to show how it sits and that little protrusion you see on its thumb is an example of how it helps strip the, uh, the bamboo. And Baragon mentioned something interesting, that there is a um, periods of controversy and in different areas that Gould engaged in. And I don't want to talk too much about that right now, because he's just, again, I just want to introduce the idea that his essays are still very relevant and very well written for an audience today. And I think he really set the template for the type of scientists who could come out and relate to a common audience. And we can come back to some of his more controversial stuff. So the book I want to talk about is Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin. Now he is a also a paleontologist and he's at the University of Chicago. And again, the full term, the full name of the book, and this is important, is A Journey into the 3.5 Billion Year History of the Human Body. And that is the central conceit of the book, is that he does basically comparative anatomy of human our human body plan and compares it to, again, different very ancient evolutionary lineages, including all the way to like simple worms. And so each example of this, uh, he talks a little bit about some of the microbiology, some of the embryology science that's very important. Now, let me mention the reason um, Neil Shubin is most well known and his kind of most famous addition to the world of science is having discovered Tiktaalik. And so that is the cover animal on the book. It's also, the picture on the lower left hand side and let me show the slide now one thing they have this very nice educational site yeah so vic has put in the inner fish home i'm going to throw in one more link which basically is to some degree about the book directly but also has a wide variety of educational resources if you ever want to go through it yourself or to use it to teach classes and i just took the slides from there for this section because they were well done uh, so let me say, so that was the central conceit of the book. The other thing that's, I think, makes this a very good book for a regular audience, although to some degree it can kind of drag, is it's very much a first person professional account of his science and work that's been done by colleagues. So the vast majority of the book are things that, a good half of the book are things that he has engaged with in terms of science or when he was a med student or when he was learning, doing embryology as a grad student. These are all kind of, the conceit. So it makes it very readable, makes it very personable. And I think he does a very good job of not trying to use science jargon to explain the concepts. And so I'll just move quickly through some of these, these main topics from the book is uh, Tiktaalik is basically an intermediate form between fish to tetrapods. Again, we are tetrapod, we have four limbs. And the the exploration that he talked about in the science of the book is trying to find this right geology and time frame to hopefully find an example of these intermediate forms. And that is really from the days of early paleontology, from Darwin's days and earlier, trying to find these missing links or intermediate forms has always been one of the main functions. And it tells us 
the family relationship, the way that we relate to all other organisms on the planet or to different sub branches thereof. Uh, some of the other stuff in the book, talking specifically about some really interesting work that was going on with um, limb development. And a lot of what's happening in this area was really understanding the morphological connections between something as simple as a fish fin all the way to the human hand, and then also other intermediate forms. But what's really interesting, and he goes through this in the book, is this interesting embryology where people can basically turn on and off genes or even just transplant little components of embry embryos to new parts and get duplications of genes, get different proportions of limbs to actually show these controlling organizing elements that, um, that helps us really understand how limb development works. And one of the key things, and this is something that I've talked about before in the what Darwin never knew, is that there are these um, switches that their modulation of how much and when they're active is what can actually help create a lot of different body plans while conserving the total number of genes that you need to use in an organism. Something he went through as well in the book is uh, this very ancient idea of pinching. And what's really interesting about this is that the ability for a, to go from just basically a three layer embryo of different gene, of different um, tissue, and then to differentiate that into things like scales, glands, uh, feathers, um, pores, to hair follicles, all relies upon this ability to invaginate and then have gene expression happen differently. And so he talks about this going very far back in terms of embryology and phylogeny. And that, um, again, one of the key ideas in evolution is that you find some sort of novel way of doing things. And that becomes a platform where you can diversify based on need, based on natural selection to do all sorts of crazy different things. Uh, another quick diagram from the book as well is discussing people I've heard about how we have gill slits when we're embryos, that you can actually map and track the, these gill slits, which are again, very fish-like, and you see that in fish embryo as well, but that the development of these goes to very specific plot, uh, parts in terms of our head and neck. And so this is just showing the uh, geography of this, but the key thing he does, and he talked about this from his medical school days, is that anybody who's ever had to learn all of the uh, cranial nerves and what their pathways are, what holes they go through, it's pretty daunting. And the reason this is, is that, that that's a body plan that came out from ancient sharks. And you can see an ancient shark is very easy to lay out those cranial nerves. The cranial nerves all have relatively short paths. They don't have strong bony things they have to go through. But by the time you change a shark head into a human head, then you aren't changing that you have these cranial nerves and then need to be in one place and start in another place. It's uh, the reason it's so crazy looking is because it came from a developmental plan that came from an ancient platform. And then of course has to change as that platform modifies for again, humans or other organisms. Um, and the last thing, I, last one I mentioned from the book is just this idea of uh, again, going from primitive forms to more advanced forms that again, very ancient organisms had the ability to detect pigments or to use pigments in order to detect visual things in their environment. And that over time, these got refined and we can actually see both the commonalities and then the adding on that makes them more specific. And one thing that's important to recognize is that the eye, again, coming around the time of the Cambrian explosion is something that was very powerful, both for evading predators and then also getting prey. And this interaction of predator prey is something that drives a lot of evolution. And that this is a common theme in terms of how we understand these things. Yeah, it's a good thing to be able to see the cupcakes again. He also talks about sense of smell. He talks about that, the, some of that as well. So just overall, what I liked about the book was, you know, it's well-written. He gives very good examples, has nice illustrations, and it really tries to connect the human body now to from to how science and paleontology and even molecular biology connect us to the origins of body parts and plants. Uh, one thing he does do also at the very end, he has a chapter called The Meaning of It All. And what's really interesting, he talks about certain diseases or afflictions that, that we have as humans that are because things happen that are strange. Like one thing that's an example is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea happens because we have these relatively weak walls and muscles in the back of our throat so they can collapse during sleeping, but that's also what allows us to speak. 
and have this high diversity of ways we can and can't speak in the noises we make. So a lot of times in evolution, there are trade-offs. And then the last thing I want to mention, so one thing he really did was trying to connect what we have as body plans to things that came from a, uh, a more primitive organism and that contributes positively uh, to body plans. And I just want to mention my other favorite author, Sean B. Carroll, and he's written several books and I've taught from them. Uh, and he has an, one book called The Making of the Fittest, where he really goes through a lot of the genetics and the microbiology as it relates to evolution and to natural selection, different examples. And the one thing he talks about in this one is the development of what are called pseudogenes, where a gene can become mutated, it's not very useful for the organism anymore, and it thus becomes a genetic fossil. And it seems kind of strange that a gene that's working perfectly is something that would then no longer be working. But if you relate it to what the organism does or does not need, it makes a lot of sense. So the example he has here in the um, phylogenetic tree is that the coelacanth, which is again, its own kind of fossil, a living fossil, it sits in the very depths of the ocean at the ocean floor. So it doesn't need to have a lot of light diversity. It just needs to have very sensitive light detection. Uh, and this is also true. And so it lost them compared to the original fish. And this is also true of dolphins and whales, the cetaceans. This is also true of different types of nocturnal primates that you don't need them. So they actually become no longer necessary and we don't spend the time making them. And maybe, and he doesn't go into this too much, but maybe not having them allows other things to work better. And so this idea, which I think is interesting, and that's what I'm kind of capping here, is the, the idea that the things that don't work in bodies from a genetic or vestigial organ also can tell us important information about the lifestyle or the development of any given organism. Like example, if they don't have opsins, they may be nocturnal. And Vic asked an interesting question about junk DNA. Uh, junk DNA actually has to do with retrotransposons or transposons, which are these mobile parasitic genomic elements. So they're not quite the same thing. And it's something I've done research in, I don't want to get you started. So I just want to end cap this, that there's a great amount of um, popularizers of science who are themselves scientists. And the ability to, I think, use computer graphics to re-represent the things from our past is something that in media is incredibly cool and powerful that, um, that young people today, I think, have a great, a great advantage with. So um, again, Sean Carroll, Stephen J. Gould, Neil Shubin, I recommend all of them, and thanks. Fantastic, uh, that uh, was a really great presentation. Um, uh, I'm really enjoying uh, the diversity of, of topics, and uh, you know, it's just so interesting to, um, uh, you know, really, uh, well, it just makes me feel that, um, uh, it reminds me of all the different kinds of topics that we, uh, enjoy here at the Science Circle and uh, how they uh, kind of dovetail into each other somehow. Um, it really gives you a sense of a, kind of a unity of knowledge, I guess. Very gratifying. And uh, well, so thank you, Stephen. Uh, let's move along now. Um, uh, Vic, uh, would you like to uh, tell us about your books and say anything you would like to, like to you know, I, I think uh, students are familiar with you, but if you want to say a few words about uh, your background or something, feel free to do that, and let's move right along. Sure. Oh, there's so many good science books out there. Um, the one I would like to share with you today is called Lab Girl by Dr. Hope Jaren. And, um, okay, it's a little bit as far as uh, background goes, is two lives ago, uh, <laughs> back before I was a professor and back before I was a military officer in the uh, most of the 70s, I was a researcher in uh, biochemistry, did some stuff at uh, NASA and at University of Hawaii. Well, the interesting thing is that this uh, person, Dr. Jaron, um, did a lot of her work at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, which is exactly where I was. I was in plant pathology and uh, she was in another lab uh, at a different time. Um, so for me, uh, this is this is a, a great book. Now, the reason it's a great book is, let me give you some idea about it. Um, 
on my slides here. Uh, it's a personal journey, what I would call a personal journey with uh, friends, both plants and animals. And she uses the, it's a little unusual in the format of the book um, because uh, she, and my dog's barking, hang on a second. <laughs> Puppy has strong opinions about this. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, first love always uh, takes the <laughs> in place of second life. Okay, so in any case, the, uh, what she does in the book is it's uh, not just about describing her own life, but uh, she uses the life of plants as a metaphor for her own struggles with life. Uh, she, from growing up in uh, childhood in Minnesota through her own research. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the way the book is laid out, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about um, uh, the science part of the book. Okay, so um, what makes a good science book? I'm sure that uh, the panel here would probably agree with me that when you're reading it, you sense a genuine curiosity and a passion and a familiarity with the topic, and it's very personal and uh, it's not just, and I, and I was thinking of an example this morning, and I was going, okay, a textbook would just go, the radius and ulna are connected to the humerus. Well, that's not a good science book to me. It's more like, here, okay, look, let me introduce you to my friends. Better yet, shake hands with them, see how the combination of humerus, radius, ulna, allow the hands to move in all directions and rotate to meet your hand. In other words, it's very personal. You can see it. You can uh, be there with the author. Um, so the way uh, she sets it out is in three parts. Um, one is about roots and leaves. And she's basically talking about growing up and in and creating her own roots and branching out. Um, her uh, father, I've got a little bit of a script here that I can add to the um, chat is her father was a science teacher for 42 years. And what he used to do is she, he used to take her to the lab. And this is, for me, this is very personal because this is how I grew up in science. And she, even before she was tall enough to, to feel the thing, you know, the smooth uh, surface of the uh, benches and the little air jets that <laughs> she could turn on and, uh, such like that while he was preparing for the next day. And she describes her, um, she wanted to be like her father, but unfortunately in the time period that she grew up, uh, she was told she was a girl and she had to do girl things. And so, um, but she also got to, so she wasn't able to do some of the things she wanted when she was a, a girl, which is by the way, the reason why she calls it lab girl but she was able to garden with her mother. And one of the descriptions she has of the soil in Minnesota was there was no clay, not like down here in Texas. <laughs> okay, but it was rich soil like devil's food cake and there was little pink earthworms wriggling around in it. And she learned that her mother, yeah. So it's, you can all, yeah, you can almost taste it uh, when in her descriptions. And her mother wanted to be, do research and go to school when she was young, but she basically found that it was men that got funded and she ended up getting married, having kids, you know, and putting off a degree until the kids are grown. Um, now, I can identify a lot with uh, Dr. Jaron as far as how she describes science in the lab, because she basically chose science as a safe home and spent most of her day here, there. Now, in when I was an undergraduate at the University of Manoa, or excuse me, University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, I didn't do all that well in my courses. I went to the courses that I liked and the other ones I didn't do, <laughs> like, and I actually didn't get a very good GPA in undergrad, um, but the lab was my home. I mean, not my apartment. I used to spend nights there. I can remember uh, doing one experiment was 36 hours uh, long and it was my, it was my real home. And so she describes the lab and the as the lights always on and 
it, it's private, but the people know each other. Uh, she can, um, uh, uh, you know, going home is just a waste of time. You can sleep in the lab and, and, and do the things she needs to and, and the hands-on type of experimentation that she had. So being in the lab enabled her to kind of be a child still. And of course, this is what they say about Einstein and others. Um, and it was her, her church, so to speak, where she learned about things. It also was a place where she describes uh, where her guilt for not having done stuff, like, you know, calling her parents, paying bills, washing dishes, shaving her legs, uh, that sort of thing was pretty much made up by what she did get accomplished. And she was a very, or she is a very accomplished scientist. Uh, the Time Magazine, magazine named her among 100 most influential people, popular science among uh, the 10, uh, brilliant 10 young. Yeah, no social media, no television, no life. Uh, although she does talk about that in the book. So for example, let me see. It, so in the second part of the book, the first part of the book is growing up all the way through her first professor job. And then she, the second part of the book is about wood and knots. In other words, the now she's a professor and she's building her own lab, but there's knots um, and problems. So she's got the worries of uh, facing research and procuring and paying for the staff and living at the lab and uh, no life on, by her own decision, more or less, and student field trips and conferences, that sort of thing. The third part of the book is called flowers and fruits. In other words, you've put in all this time and effort, and now it is uh, paying off. And but she also encounters sexism in the field and uh, struggles with mental he health. And um, so it's it's all about. It's not just about the plants, but it's also about her life and overcoming things. And then she. Uh, today, by the way, she's at the University of Oslo in Norway, where she conducts. Now, what I'd like to do real quick here is to give you a couple excerpts from the book itself. So at the very beginning, when she's growing up, she talks about um, a favorite tree of hers. And she says, and I'm just going to read it here for uh, people uh, if it's smaller, is, is a, my, my tree had been a child, too. The embryo that had become a tree sat on the ground for years, caught between the danger of waiting too long and the danger of leaving the tree too early. Any mistakes would surely lead to death. Okay. My tree had also been a teenager. It went through 10, a 10 year period where it grew wildly with little regard for the future. Between ages 10 and 20, it doubled in size and was often ill prepared for the new challenges and responsibilities that came with such height. So she goes through, and that's just, in other words, when she starts out a chapter, uh, yeah, it's excellent. When she starts out a chapter, she starts with a metaphor for her life, and then she goes on and talks about it. So, in other words, the plants and the humans in her story are both intimately uh, familiar to her. She talks about, and then the little plant that's growing up, a seed knows how to wait. Most seeds wait for a year before starting to grow. A cherry seed can wait 100 years, with no problem. What exactly a seed's waiting for is only known in a seed, but some unique trigger combination, temperature, moisture, light, uh, many other things. So you can almost, you can almost, you can almost identify with being that seed. She talks, and then she goes with the root, and she goes, okay, no risk is more terrifying than being taken by the first root. A lucky root will eventually find water, but its first job is to anchor, never again to enjoy any hope of relocating to places less cold, less dry, less dangerous. And then a leaf. As she talks about uh, leaves, the first leaf is a new idea. As soon as the seed is anchored, its priorities shift, and it directs all its energy towards stretching up. It reserves, its reserves have almost nearly run out, and it desperately needs to catch life in order to fuel the process and keep it alive. Now, in the example of a metaphor, let me just show you real quick on there. She essentially says that uh, she's talking about uh, a tree budget and her own budget. And she says the life of a deciduous tree is ruled by its annual budget. Every year during the short months from March to July, that must be up in Minnesota somewhere, down here in Texas, uh, 
things grow all year, <laughs> except for the deciduous ones. They're just starting to lose their leaves now. Um, it must grow an entire canopy of leaves. If it fails to meet its quota each year, uh, some competitor will grow into a corner of its space and the tree will eventually lose its foothold and die. That's one thing about uh, plants, of course, that's interesting is they can't. In other words, with global warming and, or excuse me, with global uh, warming average and climate change and stuff, uh, birds and flower and stuff like that may be able to adapt a bit. We can, but um, some plants just don't have a choice. They're rooted where they are. And then she talks, uh, in talking about the decisions tree budget, she talks about her own struggles with funding research and budgeting and grants, such like that. That's why I like the book. The book, I can identify it with it. It's uh, because I've lived some of it. Uh, I can feel for her own particular struggles. And it's just plain good science. I love reading about um, uh, plants and how they are both similar and dissimilar to uh, us. And that's my book that I'd like to share with you. Um, thank you, Vic. That was really great. You know, um, uh, one of the things uh, this book highlights, it seems to me, uh, one of the things, and one of the things I love about a good, popular science book, um, is you know where when the scientist is really able to convey their what they love about their subject in such a um, uh, in such a personal and unique way that really that that helps you um, like enjoy the topic almost as much as they do. Um, you for you kind of see it with new eyes and suddenly say, "Wow, this actually this subject is like really cool," um, and you can totally get why they are fascinated. By um, and so a good a good popular science book I think does that. Um, and I should I would also like to mention that um, the, uh, the the struggles with uh, uh, getting grant funding and uh, budgeting your research and so forth, you know it's hard to make a living as a scientist, and that's why I ended up going to law school. <laughs> that's the last refuge of a scoundrel. Um, so, you know, people that uh, really do stick with it and uh, are uh, and, you know, uh, put up with the, the, the difficulty of making a living in doing science, I think, uh, really deserves. Um, the, uh, let's see, is my voice okay? Um, hope I'm not too loud or too faint. Um, uh, uh, before uh, maybe uh, move on to a uh, mic, uh, I, while I'm thinking of it, I also wanted to mention a couple of uh, books on my own. Uh, one is Isaac Asimov, who I think is a great was a great popularizer of uh, actual science, not just a science fiction writer, but he wrote um, a lot of science essays that were collected into books, and also just straightforward sort of science popularizing. Uh, books, um, and he was a big influence on me in high school. Um, I traveled a lot in high school and didn't go to school much, and but I read a lot of Isaac Asimov uh, science essays and science books. So when I came back to the States and had to finish high school and take the, well, in my school we took the ACT test, but really, it was Isaac Asimov that got me into college because I learned all the science I knew from him rather than going to school. So um, I really loved that. And um, one, uh, and then I also wanted to mention an honorable mention to the science book, Godel, Escher, and Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid, which is a really um, challenging book that explains Godel's incompleteness theorem by using examples from the music of Bach and the art of uh, M.C. Escher. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a slog, but totally worth it. And um, I'm always a little bit surprised that uh, the author, Doug Hofstetter, sort of faded into obscurity over the decades, even though he has uh, written this uh, truly landmark work on Godel's theorem. Um, so while I was thinking of that, I wanted to plug uh, those two items. And uh, with that, um, I would like now to move along to Mike Shaw. And um, uh, Mike, uh, why don't you take it away and tell us about the book uh, you want to talk about? Okay, uh, Mike has his mic on. I hope everyone can hear me. 
I hope anyone yes, can hear uh, me. we can hear That's you. Fine. The voice is a little low, but uh, we can hear you fine. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I should just actually speak up instead of mumble. Uh, that would that would help things out. Um, so yeah, um, I uh, chose an Oliver Sacks book, um, Hallucinations. I actually chose Oliver Sacks rather than uh, the book. Um, so let me ask uh, my audience here: um, how how many of you are familiar with Oliver Sacks? Only a little bit. Nope. Okay. So if I uh, ask you, have you seen the movie Awakenings with Robin Williams? Well, Robin Williams played Oliver Sacks in that movie. So um, the uh, the movie is a little bit fictionalized. There's uh, relationships in there that uh, didn't didn't happen, but uh, otherwise uh, it was basically a good. Um, telling of the story of um, the people for whom uh, El Dopa uh, freed from um, oh, um, uh, Parkinsonium catatonia-like uh, state from uh, sleepy sickness they had had in the early 20th century. So, um, <laughs> so uh, here, here, here's the Wicked page. Um, so we see how it's, how it's spelled. Um, Oliver Sacks um, uh, had a, a long, uh, long career. He passed away in 2015. Uh, his first book, uh, Migraine, in 1970, uh, was a textbook on migraine, but had an approach that was uh, more like what you would have expected from a book from uh, the 1800s, where uh, much more descriptive language was used to uh, talk about uh, case histories in depth. And that was one of the uh, things that he always wanted to do in his writing. Okay? And uh, so Awakenings was the next book. Uh, and uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Uh, his um, stories, his uh, chapters in his books have always been about, um, have been about case histories uh, written with dignity and understanding of uh, people who have had um, neurological events uh, that result in um, you know specific uh, specific behaviors. In some cases, uh, brain scans allow for um, uh, pinpointing of um, like a lesion in a particular area of the brain resulting in a particular phenomenon. Um, so, uh, Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat is one I read uh, more than 20 years ago. I'm uh, craving reading it again. Anthropologist on Mars um, has a big section on uh, Temple Grandin. Um, and you know, most of his career was about um, most of his career was about uh, the neuro um, um, neuroanatomy, neuroscience. Um, he also had an interesting connection to chemistry. As you know, I'm a chemist. Uh, you may be wondering why I'm not talking about uh, chemistry popular books. Well, uh, I, I like to read something else once in a while. Um, but uh, Oliver Sacks had a great book, Uncle Tungsten, about his experiences as a child. Um, with his own um, lab that he was encouraged to study by his parents, who were both MDs. And they, um, oh my god, they let him do things that um, just make me cringe. I guess, you know, in the um, 1940s in England, you could go down to 19, early 1950s, you could go down to the local pharmacy and buy, like, sodium. Uh, yeah. The... Um, and things, things to do with sodium, and things to do like with gallium. Um, you know, these these stories are 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 wonderful. Um, I have been reading um, his later books very recently, including On the Move, which is his autobiography. Um, it was it was surprising to me. He was very uh, reticent to talk about his personal life in any of his books, even though he shared a great deal. Um, you know, until I read his autobiography written in like 2012 uh, from his long uh, career, I didn't know he was gay. Uh, and it makes sense that someone who grew up in that time and um, era 
um, 1950s in England would uh, be quiet about his personal life, especially if he was gay. I understand this completely. Um, I came out on my interview trip to where my current job, and I've been there for uh, 21 years, but that's because times have changed. Uh, in 1950s uh, in England, you may remember what happened to Aaron, Alan Turing. Uh, this was something that uh, once is a professional life, you would discuss. So, you know, I feel a connection there. Um, to get to my um, actual book, um, uh, Hallucinations, um, I, I won't go through the whole book. He's got um, a whole bunch of chapters on different types of hallucinations. The theme that runs through the book is that our many hallucinations can be um, can be um, explained, caused, result from a type of sensory uh, deprivation. So, um, you know, for the first chapter is on Charles Bonnet syndrome, and that's essentially uh, visual hallucinations. They're devoid of emotional content. They are just images people see when the um, when the um, um, input from the eyes uh, to the visual sensors of the brain starts to diminish, right? So uh, that could happen for any number of reasons. Um, you know, the, the optic nerve uh, could be uh, damaged or the eyes themselves could be damaged or um, uh, retinas uh, could be damaged. But uh, a feature that, ha that happens and can be expected to happen is that, um, in the absence of uh, input, uh, visual uh, centers of the brain uh, most likely have some uh, random activity that the rest of the brain um, makes up stories about. So upshot is that uh, people can have visual hallucinations. And the ones described um, in, in Charles Bonnet syndrome um, can, can be like, since they have no emotional content, people don't feel positive or negatively about them. They're not particularly disturbing. Um, elves in pirate dress and things like that. Um, but, um, you know, in, in later chapters of the book, he talks about folks who have um, um, olfactory sensory deprivation and having um, olfactory um, hallucinations, like they can't smell anything, and yet, um, uh, you know, certain associations will give them a vivid hallucination of an odor. Um, auditory hallucinations, even tactile hallucinations. So, um, the the experience I get from reading uh, this particular book was that uh, hallucinations are, are something that is uh, common within the human experience. And just about everyone sometime is going to experience uh, hallucinations, um, you know, either from, um, either from their uh, own mental states um, or uh, through um, interactions with drugs. He actually uh, talks about uh, some of the things he did in the late 1950s when he was uh, living in California that, that just horrify me in terms of um, you know, self self medication, um, but um, you know, and he also talked about those in his uh, autobiography on the move, and he uh, was able to move beyond those. So um, wrapping up a little bit, because I noticed our time is 12:56. Um, you know, um, I would strongly recommend reading reading Oliver Sacks, and I have just one paragraph I'd like to read from his final book called Gratitude. Uh, this was a piece called. Um, uh, my own life, and um, this is after he was uh, given his final uh, diagnosis uh, that uh, the cancer that he had in his eye had metastasized. So it goes, I cannot pretend I am without fear, but my predominant feeling is one of gratitude. I have loved and been loved. I have given, I have been given much, and I have given something in return. I have read and traveled and thought and written. I've had an intercourse with the world, the special intercourse of writers and readers. And above all, I have been a sentient being, a thinking animal on this beautiful planet, and that in itself has been an enormous privilege and adventure. So with that, I will sign off. Wow, that was a great ending. A sentient creature. 
Bravo. Well, uh, thank you very much, panelists. Um, Mike, I was wondering <clears throat> in local chat, um, you know, there's recently been um, a sort of uh, increasing interest in using psychedelics therapeutically. Um, you know, apparently they're, uh, they can be quite effective in uh, like treating schizophrenic disorders, I think, and things like that. Um, do you think that uh, Sachs's sort of a uh, candid discussion of hallucinogens uh, sort of uh, maybe informed, at least informed uh, the interest in psychedelics as uh, therapeutics? Yeah, um, I'm just curious about that because- uh, Let me uh, let you respond in voice since uh, uh, that's my, okay. my typing is terrible. Uh, yes, absolutely, I think so, uh, especially in On the Move and um, in the hallucinations books, uh, he, he details his observations of his own reactions yeah. uh, when taking um, psychedelics and other drugs. And it's particularly one event where um, he had run out of the thing that he was using to uh, sleep, which is like massive overdoses of of, of, of something and then he got DTs and had uh, several days of uh, terrifying hallucinations that friends got him through. Um, but yeah, his uh, discussion of the um, of the um, LSD, I think it was, um, you know, led to his realization that he had had a spiritual experience, except that uh, he recognized that you know, he was um, an atheist all his life. But yeah, I, I uh, um, interesting. think that's accurate. Um, it, you know, Sachs also wrote uh, beautifully about the um, the power of music to uh, help people with emotional or um, uh, or uh, you know uh, cognitive deficits and things. Um, and yeah, musicophilia. Um, and you know, and again, it's I think it's sort of the same same format of sort of describing case studies of individuals who had some sort of maybe cognitive deficit or something and how music is was able to sort of help them you know organize their thinking in different you know and or become you know more whole things like that um, and i think that's also a really fascinating topic. so um well, I, let me just thank our panelists. Those were all fantastic choices. I think we really covered a lot of interesting topics today. Um, we have a few minutes left. Do anyone, uh, does anyone in the audience have any uh, science books that they would uh, like us to give a shout out to? Oh, Carl Sagan. Yes, let's uh, let's give an honorable mention to Carl Sagan. Uh, he uh, another great science popularizer. Um, so thanks for thanks for mentioning Sagan. We probably never would have heard the end of it if we hadn't at least mentioned him. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, well, I won't belabor this. I think uh, we did pretty good uh, filling our hour, so I will um, I'll gavel uh, uh, this month's uh, panel discussion to a close. And uh, thanks again to everyone for attending, to all my panelists who I'm always impressed how well you guys uh, prepare uh, for these uh, for these talks uh, with your slides and uh, multimedia. And also thanks to Chan and Jess for helping me. Uh, put this panel together and get it advertised in a timely fashion. Uh, um, and uh, with that, uh, have a good uh, have a good weekend, you all. I'll sign off.